It's about 7.30 in the morning, so I've got to keep this fairly quiet, but we're here in the beautiful resort of Port Grumeau on the French Riviera to take a look at quite a special boat. It's called the J-Craft Torpedo, and this is it. Absolutely, you could not be more relaxed. That's a pleasure. That feels lovely. Now, as you can see, it's very much a boat that evokes the classical 50s, 60s, 70s Riva style runabout from this part of the world but interestingly this is it's not Italian it's not American it's actually Swedish built on the island of Gotland in the middle of the Baltic somewhere between the east coast of Sweden and the west coast of Latvia that's quite a remote place so when the prevailing southwesterlies and westerlies pick up, you get some big seas around there. So this is not just a pretty boat. This is quite a serious, <coughs> serious sea boat. The first J-Craft, which was built in 1999, that, that was bought by the King of Sweden. He still owns that. That's a 38 Cabrio Cruiser. We saw that actually on the water just yesterday when we were touring about in this. That's a magnificent looking boat. But what we see here, is the torpedo torpedo model that's a 42 footer instead of shaft drives it uses ips drives an entirely redesigned hull <coughs> but it's aiming to retain the essence that jcraft laid down early on which is all about a special boat hand built by craftsmen in the factory in sweden and actually <coughs> virtually everything you see here is built in-house right down to the stainless steel fittings absolutely everything there's only a couple of bits that they source elsewhere the leathers and the upholsteries the fabrics are usually sourced from quite prestigious suppliers in italy and so too that gorgeous steering wheel from nardi if we just step onto this Passerelle and take a closer look at the aft end. This gorgeous tumble home transom. This lovely curve of wood. This is all done by hand in the traditional way. They tell me it's quite similar to the way the Vikings did it on their longships. Where they've uh, basically contained the wood inside a, uh, a kind of cell and steamed it over a few hours and then clamped it into shape finished everything by hand and then given this no fewer than 18 layers of varnish the finish is really quite exquisite and this is uh, this is uh, West African mahogany uh, cultivated mahogany so it has no impact on the rainforest which is great and what a beautiful rear end that is now we've opened up these engine hatches because it's a very difficult thing for me to achieve with one hand while holding a camera as you can see, they sit just forward of this rather lovely hatch that contains the connection for the shore power. As you move forward, <coughs> what we can see here is a pair of IPS 600s. There are choices. You can have smaller engines or you can have the 650s. That's the RS version. But most go for the uh, 600s and they generate a top end on this boat which is the best part of 10 tons and 42 feet as I say uh, a top end of around 40, 41, 42 knots with the 650s you can expect 47 knots apparently but this is plenty for a boat of this type and forward here one on either side you can see the fuel tanks on this uh, boat which as I say is 12 years old these are 500 litres each 
Uh, that's been reduced, I think, on more recent models to 400 each, but you're still looking at a range in excess of 200 nautical miles quite comfortably with 20% left in your fuel tank. Now we'll take a for a drive in a moment and we'll talk more about the helm station then. But first, let's pop down below and have a little look at what we have there. There's plenty of space to get down and in with this lifting hatch. And what Redenko wanted, otherwise ostensibly a day boat, was to make sure that when you pop down below, you weren't simply greeted with a bed. He wanted this to be a, a nice relaxed saloon where you could pop down and just have a chat, cool off and relax. Now because of the classical nature of that hull, there were no hull windows, so obviously all the natural light we have comes from above, a couple of oval skylights there and a forward hatch. It's worth noting that the curves here are lovely. They're also pretty much everywhere as you can see. It's the kind of boat you really want to just touch and feel the whole time. Again, plenty more, plenty more mahogany. Very nicely put together. And this table, of course, drops into place here, so you can turn it into a double bed for comfortable weekends away. And apparently, despite the price of this boat, a lot of the clients do exactly that. The Redenko himself prefers to tuck himself away in this transverse double beneath that helm space. Again, it's beautifully put together and the woodwork really is a treat. For me, this port wet room is a bit of a triumph. When you walk in, what immediately strikes you, of course, is not the sink and the taps and the mahogany unit, the mirror, the headroom, any of that stuff. It's this tremendous throne above the, uh, above the toilet in the shower cubicle. It's a very nicely put together piece of equipment and it's tremendously comfortable. Up at the helm, this feels like quite a, a beamy, spacious sort of space. There's, there's plenty of space for two co-pilots to sit alongside you. It's a nice elevated traditional screen with these huge stainless steel frame around it, which actually makes a good kind of grabbing point because it's kind of contoured on the, on the top. It's a very nice place to be. It's got these, uh, these huge bolsters alongside this footrest down below. And that's a really comfortable way to kind of brace yourself, get a great view ahead. When you put the seat down, for me, certainly it feels a touch low. It's okay when you're, you're at displacement speeds like this, but when you get up on the plane and the nose elevates a little, it kind of limits your view a touch. But in any case, this is a more comfortable sort of way to sit or even the standing position like this is perfectly comfortable everything still falls very naturally to hand it's worth noting also that as you're you're, you're pootling along at two or three knots it's uh it's a very relaxed kind of boat to drive there's there's none of this constant corkscrewing and have to having to correct and overcorrect at the wheel directional tracking is very stable very easy so this is equipped with the 600s, and for most applications, and for most owners, that should be plenty. So let's just get it up on the plane. Those big turbo diesels winding up behind us. It's a little bit of bow lift, but nothing substantial. Within seven or eight seconds, we're quite easily on the plane. And it's interesting, uh, as you would expect, as you reach kind of two and a half thousand RPM, this is where the, it's where the throttle response really kicks in. And from this point forward, if I put the throttles down a little more, we really pick up. I 
and we're cruising along now at about 36 knots and it absolutely could not be more relaxed. And it's very clear that this screen is more than just stylistically lovely as well. There's, there's, there's absolutely no wind touching me anywhere. I mean, you have to, my hand's right up here to feel the wind blast over the top. It's very effective. Okay, we've got lovely, clean, clear water here this morning off the French Riviera, so we'll flow into a turn, okay? To starboard. And she heels over beautifully. There's lots of grip. And those are Those big Volvos are powering on gamely. We're not really losing any pace at all. We've gone down from 36.2 to 35.6. That's a pleasure. That feels lovely. It's so planted. Interestingly, it's got uh, on the aft end those kind of extended fiberglass wings. Now you've got to be quite careful with those when you're coming alongside. But I'm told by Redenko that they actually play a part when you're peeling into the turn. We do that again, we'll turn to port this time. As I look over my shoulder, I can actually see that wing interacting with the water. There's certainly plenty of grip. There's no slip here at all. We pivot around this point, which is lovely, but it clings and goes absolutely on rails. There's no letting go at all. Redenko also suggests that they assist in terms of splash deflection, keeping everyone in the cockpit nice and dry. I'm not entirely convinced by that, but they do look magnificent. And with that beautiful sort of tapered tumble home stern and that wider, beamier uh, section of the boat amidships, you kind of need those wings at the aft end just to even out the shape and style of the boat. So let's get her up to a top end and see how she does. Now we're up to about three and a half thousand RPM now. We've got a, just in excess of 40 knots on the clock. And it's every bit as relaxed as it is at 20 knots. The sound is very moderate as well. You can talk without having to raise your voice. And we have trim tabs, of course, but there's, on a morning like today, absolutely no reason to use them. On this older boat, 12 years old, uh, we have a couple of switches, manual trim tabs, no display for that. But the more recent models use the zip wake system, so you could just set it on automatic and cruise along quite happily without having to do anything at all, other than just operate the wheel and throttle. It really is quite an imperious way to travel. Sitting back alongside, it's quite a complex job really measuring up how I feel about this boat. You know, it's very clearly great to look at. It's also very charming and, and, and tremendously relaxing to drive. But it does have the flaws endemic to its type. You know, there's limited foredeck access and when you're on the foredeck, it's very slippy when wet. The, there's limited accommodation down below and what accommodation you do get has very limited natural light because of course there were no hull windows. Um, and then there's the price. It starts at 1.335 million euros plus tax. Uh, the test boat was 1.5 million euros uh, plus tax and it's quite possible you want to add a sea keeper to that. Um, for that sort of money, you know, you could quite feasibly have a 45 or 48 foot family cruiser and a house and a car and a decent bank balance to furnish that boat with fuel for a few seasons. 
Uh, but you can't consider this boat in that context. It's not about the money and the practicalities. You know, this boat, when you walk around and you, you look at the quality and you feel the quality and you actually you smell the quality of the materials, the wood and the leather, it feels special. It feels, it feels like it's the product of passionate people rather than the product of a dispassionate machine. You know, it, it won't be for everyone in terms of budget, in terms of style, in terms of its traditional approach to modern boating. It cannot be for everyone. But if you want this kind of boat, there's no doubt that this delightful hand-built sports boat from Sweden has to go down as one of the world's very best. Thank you.